Hey everybody, today I'm going to be talking about how to build a computer system. This video has two parts to it. In the first section I'll be talking about some basic things to know about computers. And in the next section I'll actually be building a computer system. Anyways, I'm going to talk about computers themselves, the case designs, the components, that sort of stuff. First I'll talk about the case design. Most modern day computer systems use what's called the ATX platform. Some machines use the Micro ATX platform, while others use the BTX platform, and others use the Mini ITX platform. This machine here is based on a mid-tower design. And this one here is a good example because it has a nice window on the side we can see inside the whole machine. I'll go ahead and cover the components in the machine and what they do. First and foremost, your power supply. That's a very important component. What it does is it takes power out of the wall, 110 volts, and converts it to different voltages for your computer to use. The motherboard is more or less another major component of the system. Almost everything in the computer connects to the motherboard. The motherboard houses your CPU, or known as a processor, your memory, graphics cards if installed, other types of add-on cards, your hard drives connect to them, your optical drives connect to them, more or less everything. Next thing I focus on is your CPU. There are different kinds of CPUs in the market from AMD and Intel. This machine uses the AMD Phenom 2 Quad Core 965 Black Edition CPU. It is based on what's called Socket AM3. CPUs have different sorts of sockets. Some from AMD are AM2, AM2+, AM3, and AM3+. Some from Intel are 775, 1366, 1155, and 1156. I mean, there are just so many different kinds of sockets, but I'll be focusing on the AMD socket AM3 platform in this video. And this particular platform uses what's called DDR3 memory, which is pretty much the standard nowadays. The memory is the REC components, as you see right back there. You might be able to see it's called G-Skill Rip Jaws Memory. Memory, also known as RAM, is another big important component in the system. Anytime you start your computer up, any files that run, programs that run, such as your operating system, which is Windows, or like any programs, they go into system memory when they're running. Many people get this confused between storage. Storage is what your hard drives are responsible for. Hard drives store your data. Memory actually houses the running programs. And of course hard drives and computers have a wide range of sizes. The standard nowadays is at least I'd say 500 gigabytes to 1 terabyte. The more space you have, the more files you can store on your machine. Another important component in computers is your optical drives. These can be DVD drives, DVD burners, CD drives like CD burners, Blu-ray drives, etc. Some computers don't have these, such as netbooks, they don't have these. Another couple of components you'll see in computers is floppy drives and card readers. Floppy drives are not very common anymore. Card readers are, be are becoming the norm nowadays with computers. Card readers are where you can insert cards from your cameras and other devices to import data, that sort of stuff. And of course on the front of the case down here we have USB ports and audio jacks. Of course USB ports are where you plug up your other devices and audio jacks where you can plug up a microphone or a headphone. And of course now I'll talk about graphics cards. Graphics cards are responsible for creating the image you see on your screen, more or less putting it all together. High-end machines have multiple graphics cards and, that, and very high-end graphics cards at that. This machine here only has one graphics card and it's more or less a low to mid-range graphics card. I'm planning on replacing it pretty soon, but anyways. Very low-end machines for like business use, that sort of stuff, have the graphics integrated into the motherboard. This is usually not a very high-performance setup, but it's good enough for basic tasks. 
This is why gaming machines have up to four or more graphics cards. And I'm going to talk about the CPU a little more. You can't actually see the CPU because it's actually under a cooler. Most computers run on what's called air coolers, like these. Or like that over there inside this machine. This computer here is liquid cooled for a reason. This is a custom built machine that you can really customize. And the reason for liquid cooling is to cool the processor down to lower temps to get what's called a better overclock out of the CPU. Overclocking is more or less pushing components past manufacturer specifications. Normally the CPU in this, pro in this machine runs at 3.4 GHz. I got it overclocked to 3.8 GHz. And when you start overclocking you start increasing the amount of heat output. CPUs run hot and they must be cooled. Without a cooler, a CPU will burn up in a matter of seconds. Next I'll focus on how hard drives and optical drives and stuff connect to the motherboard. Hard drives and optical drives can use either SATA cables or IDE cables. IDE cables are an older style design and you can see there are these big fat cables. These are actually sleeve for aesthetics. Down here on the hard drives you can see these orange cables and one has a yellow cable. These are SATA cables. These are much smaller and are actually better than these. Much more efficient design. Now I'll talk about add-in cards. When it comes to a PC you can you can customize it to, to do almost anything. This machine here has of course a firewire card which I never use. It has a modem for faxing and it has a TV tuner because I watch t TV and record TV on this computer. I mean, there is so many different types of add-in cards you can install to a computer to make it do whatever you want to do. And of course, I'll talk about cooling a little bit more. Like I say, this machine has a liquid cooling system for the CPU, but of course, most systems have case fans to circulate air in through the machine. And the power supply is a fan to cool itself. Now I'm going to focus on a different machine just to show you an example of how much different PCs can be. Here's another machine. This is my parents' machine. And it's more or less a high performance internet browsing machine because it has a dual core processor that's overclocked and it has a very basic graphics card for any time my parents use Google Earth, which is a graphics hungry program. This machine has a SATA hard drive and IDE style optical drives. IDE cables look like ribbon cables when they're not sleeved. And those green components with the black chips is the memory. This machine uses DDR memory. And the reason why this memory don't have the red or blue pieces of metal is because this is basic memory. High performance memory has heat spreaders on it for overclocking purposes to help keep it cool. This machine is, has a different style of case. It's a full size ATX tower it's a mid tower actually but it's a little bit smaller than my other machine it has different style fans and this machine is air cooled here's another system this is based on the micro ATX platform have a look at the back here you may notice it has a smaller power supply in it the power supply is much smaller and this machine is slim but not as slim as a mini ITX platform you can have a look back here we can see the graphics card and two separate TV tuners I'll go ahead and pop the cover so you can have a look inside this machine okay I've now pulled the cover off the system you can have a look inside here this computer uses a micro ATX motherboard which is smaller than a standard ATX motherboard here are the two TV tuners and here's a graphics card one thing I'm going to point out is that expansion cards use a different kind of, use different kinds of slots some can be PCI and some can be PCI Express graphics card, modern day graphics cards use PCI Express slots 
and expansion cards use a really, really small version of that PCI Express slot. Here is a DVD burner which is hooked up with an IDE cable. And here's the hard drive in this machine is hooked up with a SATA cable. This computer is only used as a home theater machine. It runs Windows Media Center, which is an included component of Windows 7. And this computer is only used to watch TV and record TV shows. That's why it has two separate TV tuners in it. This machine is never used for any like desktop usage such as like internet browse and that sort of stuff. It's just used as a TV computer. Right here is an example of a small four-factor PCI Express slot. This is called a PCI Express times one slot for expansion cards. This is where the TV tuner in this machine is hooked up at. And directly below it is the graphics card slot, which is a PCI Express 16. This way you can have a visual of what the slots look like. Anyway, is that some basic information to know when you're building a computer system? Like I said, there's so much information on computers I can all cram so much into a video. Anyways, in the next segment of this video, you're going to watch me build a computer system. And I'll be going through all the steps in detail. Hey everybody. Today we're going to be building a business class desktop. It's going to be a new member of the Cube Computer family. It's going to be the Cube Computer Business Class Desktop BCD 1.0. Here is the quote for this computer. It is being built for Huntersville Concrete Construction. Anytime you go to build a system, it's good to have some sort of layout of a base setup. And in this particular setup, we have a Q computer supplied, mini ATX case, recertified power supply, which is only a few years old, it's barely been used selling it for ten dollars in this build including a fax modem and for base we have an Athlon 2 dual core 245 Rieger CPU 2.9 gigahertz <clears throat> but in this system the built um, the owner opted to have a Athlon 2 quad core 640 3 gigahertz CPU installed in this system it's going to have a micro ATX Foxconn a74 ML-K 3.0 revision AM3 motherboard and 4 gigabytes of G-Skill DDR3 SD RAM memory it's going to have a Western Digital Caviar Grain 500 gigabyte hard drive which is one of the better performance drives that has 32 megabytes of cache in it it's going to have a C slash DV burner it's going to have Windows 7 Home Premium which the owner of the system decided to get the family pack since it's around holiday season to have Windows 7 installed on two other computers in the home and the, the total cost of the new egg items for this system was around $404 plus the memory for a different computer which was $31.99 and the total price was about $444 so this is basically Subtracting the 30 bucks from this, this system costs around, I would say, 410 and 420 dollars. Not too bad for a quad core business machine. Here's the parts that just arrived for the computer. This here is memory for a different computer in the home. So the rest of the stuff you see here is parts for the new business computer. The power supply has already been installed along with the new hard drive because the hard drive comes in a separate order. Here is our Foxconn mainboard, our family pack of Windows 7, our AMD CPU, DVD burner, 4 gigabytes of DDR3 memory, and a USB 2.0 internal 3.5 inch all in one card reader. Here's a look inside the chassis, and here is our hard drive. Here's our power supply. 
I'm going to touch on a few things to note about choosing a power supply for a computer. When you're looking for a power supply for a computer, the thing you got to know is what you want to use the computer for. This power supply is a Delta Electronics 300 watt power supply. Like I say, it's barely been used. It's in really good condition. I've already tested it myself. It works very well. Max output power is 300 watts. It has 19 amps to the 12 volt rail. 5 volt rail has 25 amps. And our 3.3 has 18 amps. 5 volt standby is 2 amps. So this is a decent power supply for this kind of setup. Unlike how a lot of OEMs nowadays, like HP, include like 250 watt power supplies. If you guys watched my previous video on the HP Magnesium Gray desktop, I did some research online and I found out that computer had a 250 watt power supply in it, which is, in my opinion, really cutting it for a system that is really similar to how this one is going to be set up. Also, when choosing a power supply, you need to make sure you have one that is 24 pin for your motherboard if it supports the 24 pin and to have one that has the adequate amount of connections for your system and at least two SATA connections for our hard drive and our DVD drive and we have also one, two, three, four, five Molex connections on this power supply along with one floppy disk connection Next thing I'll do is go ahead and install the front panel drives, such as the card reader and the optical drive. <coughs> Installing front panel drives in this case is a simple operation. What you do is you install these screws to the drive you want to install, and then you pull off the front panel, the front bezel, like so. And set to the side. As you see, the buttons are still there. They are not attached to the front bezel. They're attached to the case. It's a good design. <clears throat> and now we'll go ahead and just slide this into place, like so. Feed the cable in. Run the screws into the track. The drive is now installed. I'll be doing the same for the optical drive. Now I'll go ahead and install the optical drive. So simple. Now I'll go ahead and replace this. All done. Now we'll go ahead and move on to preparing the motherboard for installation. What I mean by preparing the main board is to get the main board out and install our CPU and our memory. So first we'll go ahead and unbox our motherboard. Here is the motherboard. Not a bad looking main board. Under here we have some more stuff. We have two set of cables, user's manual, quick install guide, driver C and software, and last but not least the IO shield plate for the case. Quite, it's quite common nowadays to see motherboards no longer inc include serial ports or parallel ports on the I.O. show plate. Here is our video in terms of EGA and DVI. Anytime you're working with sensitive electronic equipment, it's important to understand the procedures for um, electrostatic discharge. I always touch something like a case that's grounded before handling the equipment, which I have just done. So now we'll go ahead and, and take the motherboard out of the packaging here.
<clears throat> now we'll set the main board on top of the ESD packaging. Next we'll go ahead and unpack our CPU because it's next to go installed. This is a socket AM3 motherboard and we have a socket AM3 CPU. This is the Athlon 2640. Now I'll go ahead and unbox our CPU. I'm going to cut the seal here. I've unboxed plenty of AMD CPUs in the past. Here is the processor itself, along with the case badge, our user's manual with the warranty information, all that kind of stuff. And we have our retail cooler that comes with the box CPUs, which we'll be using it on this particular CPU. Since this is a business computer, we're not doing any extreme like overclocking or anything like that. This, this, this design is not really designed for overclocking. So we'll go ahead and, and use the box cooler. Now we'll go ahead and install the CPU to the motherboard. Remove the processor from its packaging, which never handle an AMD CPU by its pins, always handle it by its sides, like so. These pins are very fragile, you gotta be very careful with them. And you just line the CPU up with the triangle on the socket, and it should drop right into place. Do not force it into place. Keep one finger on the CPU to apply pressure and then lock the socket. CPU is now installed. Since the CPU has been handled with my fingers, I'm going to go ahead and clean it before I install the cooler. This will help ensure that it gets good, con good contact between the, the CPU itself and your heatsink. the CPU nice and clean now if I was doing a high-end system for overclocking I probably wouldn't, like I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be using the retail cooler in the first place but in some cases some people may want to remove the stock thermal compound and apply something like arctic silver in this case, we're going to use what's already included. It will do just fine. So we'll go ahead and install this cooler. Simple clip design. We'll just drop it down into place. You want to take both levers and we will lock them into place like so. Cool, here's a little tricky we got into place just now. We'll go ahead and Make sure both clips are locked into the retention bracket, and then we will lock the core into place. Make sure our core is on tight, which it is. Never forget to plug your fan plug into the header on the main board. CPU is now installed. Now it's time to go ahead and install the memory. And I have to say, install memory or upgrading the memory on a computer system has got to be one of the most simple operations you can do on your system to improve its performance. Even average Joes can do this. I mean, it's really simple. You just take the modules, line them up like so. into the retention brackets on the 
motherboard. You press down. Memory is installed. Now I'll go ahead and do it with the, for the second stick. Like I say, it's a very simple operation. This is DDR3 memory, which the installation procedures is basically the same for about all the memory on the market. Memory is now installed. Before we install the motherboard, we need to go ahead and prepare the case. First thing to do is make sure all the standoffs are in place for the motherboard, which they already are. So this is the micro ATX case. Our next step would be to go ahead and install the IO shield plate, which is in this package. Alright, remove it from the package. And it will snap in like this. And seeing since our motherboard has integrated LAN, we need to go ahead and pop this out. Out of the way. And now we're going to snap it into the case, like so. Which be careful with these sometimes, they can be sharp and you won't get cut. Bear with me. Sometimes these things can be a little tricky to get in. This one is one of them. There it goes. Do this. Sometimes a screwdriver, back to the screwdriver can help get it in. One more corner down here. Now the IO shield plate is installed. Now I'm going to set the motherboard into place. Be very careful when you do this. Line everything up with the IO shield plate. And set the board into place. Sometimes the IO shield can, plate can make it a little bit difficult to get the board to stay on the screw holes. So what you would do is go ahead and install a screw somewhere, like let's say right about here. We'll install this one. Go ahead and start screwing it in, but don't tighten it all the way. Do the same for another screw. Like this. Then get started in, but don't tighten it out of the way. And just continue to do this throughout the entire main board. Now that all the screws are in place, we'll go ahead and make sure the screw holes of the main board are centered on all the screws and we're going to start tightening the screws into place. Now we can tighten them up. But don't over tighten. That's an important thing to consider. Be nice to your main board. Don't over tighten the screws.
Okay, all done. Now it's time to go ahead and plug up our leads to the main board. In which this motherboard here has color codes for the front panel leads, such as your hard drive LED, your power LED, your reset switch, your power switch, all that sort of stuff. And with this particular motherboard, we'll, have to, we'll probably have to refer to the manual to get all the codes. Here's the information in the user's manual on how to hook up the components to the front panel switch, your buttons and your LEDs. Now I'll go ahead and install these leads. Leads to the power button, reset button, and LEDs along with the speaker have been plugged into the motherboard. As you might be able to see here. Now we're going to plug up the power connections along with our USB connections. This motherboard needs two connections from the power supply. Our 24 pin connection along with our 4 pin ATX 12 connection. So we'll go ahead and plug those in now. Our 24 pin ATX goes plugged in right here. It is snapped right into place. And our ATX 12 volt goes installed right here behind the CPU. Power connections are now installed. We'll go ahead and install our USB plugs, which this motherboard has three USB headers one here, one here, and one here. First, we'll go ahead and plug in our connections for the case's front panel USB connection, like so. And on a USB header on the main board, you will usually have one pin on the very edge. This is the ground side, and the other side is where your red pins go installed. If your case has leads scattered all over the place and not something like this or something that's combined together, refer to your motherboard's manual on how to hook that up. In most cases, it's red, white, green, black. Red being 5 volts, black being ground. So we'll go ahead and, and plug those in now. And our ground leads will go plugged in right here, on the very edge. I'm going to give you a closer look here. As you can see, here are the USB headers. And I stated earlier how you have one pin by itself. That's your ground side, and the opposite side is your 5 volt side. As you can see, we have how we have this plugged in here. Here's a 5 volt lead here. Here's a ground lead on this side. And your data connections are in the center. Now we'll go ahead and plug in the USB header to our card reader, which is like this. It goes plugged in like so. Our card reader is now plugged in. A lot of cases on the market nowadays have connections for the front panel audio. However, this case does not. In this case, had front panel audio connections. They will go installed right here. Now we'll go ahead and plug up our SATA devices. We have a SATA hard drive and a SATA DVD burner. First, we'll go ahead and make the appropriate power connections. So now we'll go ahead and plug 
and the power supply connections to our hard drive like so this power supply has locking connectors too is pretty nice and we'll make the other connection to our DVD drive there's a close-up of the SATA power connection We'll go ahead and plug it in now. Now we're going to make the appropriate cable connections to our main board. We'll go ahead and plug these cables in like so. And this connection will go to SATA 2 on the motherboard. You might be able to see where it says SATA 2. This is where we'll plug this cable in. Right here. And we'll do the same for the hard drive. Our save devices are now installed. All the cabling is installed now. I have redone everything a little bit to help reorganize the cables a little bit to improve airflow and make everything more efficient. I notice how a lot of system builders out there like to use zip ties, which they do the job, but it can be a pain if you ever had to go reuse the cables for anything. So I use electrical tape to bundle up excess wires. So the last thing we gotta do here is install modem for faxing and install a cooling fan right here. Installing a modem like any other PCI card is fairly simple. Just look at a PCI slot on the motherboard and you just slide it into place. And you'll install a screw here to fasten it. All done. Now we're going to install our cooling fan, which we're using a 92 millimeter fan since this case can support it. The good thing about this particular case is on the side panel it does have a duct to allow cool air to go to the CPU, which is a good thing for almost any system, in my opinion. So now we'll go ahead and install our cooling fan to the case which is this fan right here just line up with the holes and you just mount it in <clears throat> now let's plug the fan into an available header on the main board Now we're done assembling the computer system. It's now time to test it. We're using the integrated graphics on this system rather than installing a graphics card since it's a business machine. Now it's time to go ahead and test the computer. We'll go ahead and turn it on and first thing we'll do is enter the BIOS setup utility and go straight to the hardware monitor. Some PC health status on this particular board. And go ahead and check all of our temperatures and voltages and all that kind of stuff. And apparently, this is another one of those motherboards out there with this particular BIOS. My old ECS Enforce 9M A had the same issue for the CPU temperature. It will not read anything below 40 degrees C. However, if the temperature does end up going above 40 degrees C, it will 
correspond then. It will actually go above 40, but it never goes below 40. This is kind of funny. Everything looks good to go. Go ahead and check everything is properly configured in the BIOS, like our date and time, which is not. So we have to go ahead and set everything the way it should be. I'll go ahead and pan back out a little bit so you can get a better view of the screen. So we now need to go ahead and make sure our date and time is correct, which it is not. It is December 16th, 2010, so we need to go ahead and make some changes here. The time is 3.48 p.m., so in correspondence to this, it is 15.48. And notice how a hard drive is being detected and our CD-ROM is being detected. And of course down here we'll look down a little bit. It tells us about our CPU which is the Athlon 2 quad-core 640 and our memory size which is 4 gigabytes of memory. Go to the advanced BIOS. Check our boot device priority. So we, this needs to be backwards. So as well, it'll accept the CD first before going straight to the hard drive. And make sure our hard drive is number one here in the priority in the hard disk drives. The rest of these are the card readers. They are also known as hard drives in the BIOS, like a USB device. You can boot straight from that if you wanted to. And of course, our CD DV drive. This is some options for overclocking, which we're not doing that. Let's just have a look anyway. It does give you some options here. If you were to overclock this. Some people said that these motherboards weren't good for overclocking, but this one may actually be okay. I don't know. I'm not really familiar with this board. We're just going through and setting everything up. Advanced chipset features. It has decent configuration for your memory timings and all that stuff. Internal graphics mode is enabled. Integrated peripherals. And this motherboard can do RAID in AHCI. Actually, we will go ahead and disable the IDE controller since we're not using it. This is our USB configuration. Super I.O. Trusted compu computing. Not exactly sure what this is. Onboard LAN. It's the audio controller, <clears throat> power management, make sure it's set to S3. And of course, here's the security settings in the BIOS, and of course, back to our PC health status. So, our CPU is under 40 degrees Celsius right now, or at 40 degrees Celsius. We can now go ahead and in install the side panel. This computer is ready to go. Our next step will be to install Windows. And here is the system with the side panel installed.